So let's see what a corresponding hardware would look like for this, right? And what I'm saying is that this hardware element that I'm building up essentially is going to look something of this sort, right? There are two computational units. There is a multiplier, right? Uh, with in one and in two and an output. And similarly, there is an adder, right? Again, with its own in one, in two and output. Okay. And the inputs to the multiplier and the adder, I have basically shown them looking like multiplexers. And that, of course, is intentional, right? Because I know that I am using the same multiplier in order to do many different operations, right? And I will need to feed in the correct operation at the, at the correct input at the correct time instant, right? Now, from our discussion on folding, you know that the way that we did this was that, you know, we would actually take the appropriate output of the multiplier or adder, delay it by a certain number of clock cycles, etc., and make sure that it gets fed in to those multiplexers at the correct phase of the clock, right? The correct time instant, right? Here, I'm using a slightly different approach. What I'm saying is, I have this left-hand side column marked as inputs, which basically has all the values, I0 up to I6, right, permanently over there. And on the top, I have this box, which I have marked as regs, the registers, which are the values R0 to R4, okay? And they are also permanently available. They are just registers that are available over there, right? And what I can do, for example, is the multiplexers, right? What I'm going to do is connect all the registers to each and every one of those multiplexers, right? So this the drawing that I've shown, it makes it look as though there's only one connection. But in practice, what I'm actually saying is all the registers are connected to all of those multiplexers, right? What does that mean? It means that at any given point in time, in one of the multiplier can get an input from any one of the registers. Similarly, into of the multiplier can also get an input from any one of the registers. Okay. I can do the same thing with the inputs as well. Right. I have all of those inputs, I0 to I6, and I basically say I will connect all of them to the multiplexers. What that means is the multiplexer has at least, in this case, seven inputs plus five registers, so 12 inputs to the multiplexer. Right, which means something like four select lines so that I can pick out which one I want as the output of the multiplexer. Similarly, the outputs that are generated by this, right? in this case, at least they don't need to go back to the, in, uh, to the input column. They will always go back to one of the reg uh, variables. right? So those things, the outputs that are generated over here will need to go into R0 to R4, one of them. right? So I'm drawing that as a demultiplexer, which basically says that you know I will sort of clean this up and decide which signal, uh, which of those registers is actually getting updated, right? Of course, there are a few more subtleties over here. For example, one of the things is, can I update more than one register at the same time? What happens if both, an, both my adder and multiplier are trying to update the same register at the same time and so on, right? Obviously, I need to make sure such a thing cannot happen. In this case, you know, given the schedule that I have, luckily, of course, you know, nothing of the sort is going to happen. So it's all good, right? But in practice, you will also need to make sure of that, that you are not sort of clashing. Two, P, uh, two hardware units are not trying to update the same register at the same time and so on. Okay. Now, once I have all of this, right? So this hardware is available to me. I need, this is my, you know, uh, those, that multiplier and adder and to some extent the multiplexers and these registers, inputs and so on constitute the data path, okay? So why I'm saying it's the data path is because it's either storing some values or computing with it or moving the data around, okay? These are all the elements that are responsible for doing that. But as I said earlier, there is the second important part, which is basically the control, right? Which needs to implement this table on the right, okay? So if I look at the table on the right, what does it say? It basically says that there is some kind of a counter, counter t which is going 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 and whenever t is equal to 0 i need to make sure that you know i0 and i1 are fed into the multiplier and uh, the output is routed to register r0 similarly i1 and i3 are fed to the adder and the output is routed to r4 okay one way by which this could be done is by using something called a finite state machine control 
okay and the simple idea of what is a finite state machine essentially what we have is you know you would have some kind of first initial state an s0 an ideal state right and i would get some kind of a start signal okay and one way of thinking about this would be this could be that start signal could be the function call which basically says you know do this if you are right if you are thinking in terms of software it could be a function call but more importantly we are thinking in terms of hardware right this is the sort of hardware model that we have built up over here so for this hardware model what we are saying is the start signal would be provided by somebody from outside right they would first have to make sure that i0 to i6 are all correctly in place right r0 to r4 maybe they need to be reset maybe not right that part uh, depends on, again on you know how the computation is being done but once i0 to i6 have been made available at the inputs the finite state machine is now sitting ready and i can give it a start signal okay what happens when i give it a start signal it moves to a new state called s1 okay and the way that i'm defining this is i'll say that in state s1 perform the computations m1 and a4 okay now that is how i will define my state what impact does that have on my hardware it will basically say that in order to do m1 i need to feed i0 as in one of the multiplier i1 as in two of the multiplier and take the output and route it to r0 similarly in order to do a4 i need to feed i1 as in one of the adder i3 as in two of the adder and take the output of the adder and route it to r4 Okay, all of that happens in state one, right? Now the interesting thing you will realize is, the moment I think in terms of a finite state machine like this, I am potentially opening up the possibility that you know, that state may even take more than one clock cycle to execute. So if my multiplier, in other words, is slow, I could even think in terms of okay, you know, I will allow multiple clock cycles for it to operate. Of course, you know, right now that is not the case, right? I have drawn a schedule over here where I am assuming that. in clock cycle number 0 marked by this t over here in clock cycle number 0 m1 is scheduled and it also finishes within the same clock cycle right and similarly in clock cycle number 1 m2 is scheduled and finishes a5 is scheduled and finishes and so on okay so the finite state machine control in other words will say that during state s1 m1 and a4 are to be executed after that in the next clock cycle right unconditionally pretty much it just switches over to state s2 where m2 and a5 are to be executed goes all the way down up to s7 where a3 is to be executed okay and in each of these states what are the what is the control logic supposed to do it has to send control signals to the multiplexers right it just has to give the appropriate input to each multiplexer so that the correct values are sent to the hardware units for computation now at the end of this after i have finished all these seven states what do i need to do i have to check a condition right is x less than a if so i go back to s1 and start repeating this computation okay but if x is greater than or equal to a i instead go back to the ideal state because my effectively you know that while loop you remember that we had for the differential equation it has been satisfied which means the entire computation is completed i finished the numerical integration i go back to my ideal state where presumably somebody will give me a new set of uh, you know c1 c2 x uh, x initial y initial etc and uh, you know i'll uh, be ready for a new start signal so there's a question what will trigger a state change so this is what i'm saying i mean the way that i've drawn it is the transition from s0 to s1 is based on the start signal okay so in other words the system will remain in the s0 state until it gets a start signal telling it to start a new computation but s1 to s2 for example if you look at it i don't have any condition on that arrow okay which means it's an unconditional change it will wait for one clock cycle in s1 and next clock cycle it will shift to s2 okay so i mean for those of you who have some familiarity with writing the code in verilog you would realize that you know this is basically effectively how you would code the state machine is precisely this you would basically say that you know in state s1 
do some you know put out some output signals corresponding to m1 and a4 and in the next clock cycle in the next state is equal to s2 that's it right it's unconditional it does not check anything after s1 you move to s2 then s3 up to s7 okay so only the only place where conditions come into the picture is the s0 to s1 right that waits for start similarly from s7 where to go next depends on a condition that needs to be satisfied if x is less than a it will go to s1 and continue the computation once more if s is uh, if x is greater than or equal to a it will go to s0 okay so this basically shows how a finite state machine could be implemented in order to get this entire thing computed so s1 s2 up to s7 it will take seven cycles in order to compute one iteration which is exactly what i have got over here right so i have basically shown that t going from 0 up to 6 will finish one complete iteration of this system okay now on the other hand of course you know uh, you can you will probably notice that after i have uh, finished one iteration if x is less than a i will immediately go back into the next clock cycle i'll once again start so you know it's exactly every seven clock cycles i'll be finishing one iteration on the other hand once i have finished x is greater than or equal to a i will have at least one step where i go to the s not state okay so for at least one clock cycle there will be dead time between one set of computations and the next okay what i mean by that is for a given value of c1 c2 x y u uh, dx and a there will be some you know depending on maybe it has to run 100 times it will take 100 into 7 clock cycles plus one clock cycle when it goes back to id and during that time you can give it a new set of values for uh, all this x y u dx a c1 and c2 and it can immediately start the next computation right but yes one iteration has been scheduled in seven clock cycles between successive calls to this entire computation you will have one dead cycle because of the going to s0 because of the way that the state machine works now this is in fact a good representation of how things are done by vivado hls right vivado hls actually tries to construct these kind of state machines for most of your computations right you remember the code that we discussed uh, last time around if you dig a bit further into the code you will realize that this is pretty much what it's trying to do right it takes those different uh, sort of c steps that we saw in the analysis view of the vivado hls and says that i will generate one state corresponding to each one of those and you know what is the entry condition into the state what is the exit condition from the state all of that is coded into the verilog okay so a large part of the verilog code that is generated by vivado hls basically corresponds to this control logic in this way 